This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning to our colleagues over at Santa Monica Hospital as well, who are uh, also observing this today. And this is the annual Gwen Hayes and Cherry Family Stephen A. Feig Endowed Lectureship in Pediatric Cancer and Blood Diseases. And just a brief history on this. It was in the 1950s that Marion Davies' gift allowed the building of the Marion Davies Children's Clinic which now houses the offices and research laboratories of the Children's Discovery and Innovation Institute. She approached Lita Hazen, who had lost a daughter to acute lymphoblastic leukemia, to fill in the shell of the A floor of the Marion Davies Children's Clinic as the Gwyn Hazen Cherry Memorial Laboratory to be occupied by pediatric hematology oncology. Lita Hazen continued to donate to the division on a yearly basis through Art Moss. <clears throat> After his retirement, she continued to donate through Steve Feig. Ultimately, she brought her grandchildren, Allison and Adam, to contribute to the division. Although Lita passed away in the mid-90s, her other daughter, Cynthia, as well as Adam and Allison, contributed to the division on an ongoing basis. When Steve Feig retired in 2005, the family endowed this lectureship in honor of Steve Feig and Gwen Hayes and Cherry. Over the years, the family has donated a total of more than $4 million to UCLA. We're grateful for their sustained support of children's cancer research over the years and the impact that this has made on the survival of children with cancer. We are also thankful for the contributions of Dr. Steve Feig as a leader, researcher, educator, and role model. So this year, for the 2014 Gwen Hayes and Cherry Stephen A. Feig Distinguished Lectureship, we are very, very privileged to have Susan Shuren, who is the Deputy Director of the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute, with us today. When we look at Dr. Shuren's CV, we see a life which is rich of accomplishment and services to others. Her undergraduate work was completed at Harvard, followed by her medical degree from Johns Hopkins. She remained at Hopkins for her pediatric internship, completing a pediatric residency and chief residency at Boston University. Following this, she was a fellow in pediatric hematology and oncology at Children's Hospital Medical Center of Boston and the Dana-Farber Cancer Center, and a research fellow at Mass General Hospital. After completing her training, she accepted an academic appointment at Case Western Reserve, where she rose to the ranks to full professor and served in a number of capacities there, including division chief of hematology oncology for several years and senior executive and vice president on the Case Western University President's Council. She has been deputy director of the NHLBI since 2006, including acting director of the National Heart Lung Blood Institute from 2009 to 2012. If you see her CV, you would know that I could easily spend the rest of this hour describing the many activities that she has been involved in and within those roles as well as her many accomplishments. Let me suffice it to say that she has been a tireless advocate for children and the importance of training a new generation of medical scholars. Her leadership and advocacy have impacted our current generation and many to come. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce our 2014 Gwen Hayes and Sherry family, Stephen A. Feig, distinguished lecturer, Dr. Susan Shuren. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Ted. Uh, it's a uh, tremendous pleasure and uh, honor to be here. I have to figure out how to advance this. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I've had an absolutely wonderful week having a chance to meet with the faculty and with fellows and am just really impressed with the, the quality of the work that's going, uh, that's going on here. Um, my, I have to give you my declarations of interest. I work for the, uh, for the federal government. I'm actually not allowed to have any conflicting financial interests. Uh, my friend Alan Guttmacher, who's the director of the uh, National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, has an introductory slide which shows a picture of Leavenworth, which is where he says he would be if he had any conflicting interests. I mean, that may be an overstatement. Uh, <clears throat> but I do have to tell you that my comments do not necessarily reflect the views of the U.S. government. And I'm very honored to be invited uh, to give the Gwen Hazen Cherry Stephen Feig uh, MD lecture. Steve and I have known each other since um, the late 1970s. Steve trained in the program in Boston a, f a few years ahead of me and actually had, uh, had come out here by the time I started. But I got to know him through alumni events and also through the Children's Cancer Group in which we were both working and it's been a pleasure to have known uh, Steve and his wife Judy over, uh, over many decades and to be able to consider both of them very good friends. What I'd like to talk about today uh, are sort of a, a number of topics in terms of where pediatric research and pediatric academics, uh, sort of part of where it's coming from, but also a lot of where it's, where it's going, and the importance uh, and the role of, of research and of pediatric investigators in, in, in continuing advances. Talk a little bit about the current, uh, the nature of support for pediatric research uh, and some of the things which I think are particularly important important for pediatric academicians and pediatricians in general to really keep in mind in terms of ensuring that the needs of the next generation remain uh, high on the uh, priority list for, uh, for, for public investment and a little bit about making the most of some of the opportunities, because even though things are rather difficult right now, one of the things that's particularly exciting is that there have really never been more opportunities in science and in health than there are right now. So where, where have we come from? Uh, I think it's really important to keep some of these things uh, in mind, because over the last century, we've made tremendous progress. If you look uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, there were 200 uh, deaths per 100,000 births in the, in the first year. The major causes of those deaths were infection, trauma, and nutrition. These were, were huge public health problems. And over the course of, of the last century, uh, there were a tremendous number of advances between the two world wars. There were a lot of advances in hygiene, uh, which made a big difference in terms of, of, of uh, childhood deaths. World War II, uh, among other things, led to the development of penicillin, which had actually been discovered uh, and was actually published in 1929, but didn't get developed for um, human use until first the Brits and then the U.S. government uh, developed penicillin to, um, to use for in, in the war, to use for, for soldiers. And then in the period after the Second World War, a huge explosion of findings in health that have, have had a massive impact. Uh, this includes vaccines, the development of oral rehydration therapy. Uh, at the, uh, just as we were going into the 60s, the, the UN really got into the game with the UN Declaration of the Rights of the Child. And then tremendous advances in genetics, where I'm not in, I shouldn't have indicated that it actually ends in 2010, it doesn't. Uh, <clears throat> neonatal and oncology care, and the emergence of some new problems, uh, obesity, type 2 diabetes. And most of my practice, I never saw a child with type 2 diabetes. Uh, <clears throat> and so now we have a situation in which there are, in this country, 6.8 deaths in the per 100,000 births in the first year. Obviously, a tremendous improvement over the 200 at the, uh, at the turn of the last century. Uh, trauma is still a problem, but not anything like the problem uh, that, it, <clears throat> that it was a century ago. The problems in nutrition are different. And many of the issues that, uh, that plague us relate to chronic disease rather than acute infectious disease, although none of those have exactly gone away. 
So how did we get there? That's a, that's a lot of progress uh, over uh, over a century. It's a whole lot more progress than had been made in uh, in the 2,000 years before that. Um, how do we learn what we know? And the key issue that I'd like to sort of emphasize is that most, virtually all of these advances in public health come because of research, which was then implemented uh, in <clears throat> both in terms of medical practice, but also uh, in in many in many public health settings. This is based on a lot of very careful observational and ep epidemiologic research, a lot of very, very elegant basic science research, the development of animal models, careful clinical observation, particularly in pediatrics where we have experiments of nature uh, and you learn something about normal function when people are born with problems uh, in which those, those normal functions don't occur. Uh, that's been the, the origin of, of a lot of advance, advances. Some well done investigator initiated clinical trials. People see what the clinical problems are, put together uh, studies to actually address some of these questions and advance the field. A tremendous amount of collaboration between epidemiologists, basic scientists, and clinicians. It's hard to overemphasize the extent to which advances made by any one of those groups is dependent upon uh, advances that are, are made by others. And then a huge number of technical advances. Uh, the, um, uh, the technology to answer questions more easily, more effectively, more quickly uh, has been very important in terms of our ability to make some of these advances. You can see that the tremendous drop, this is not over the last century, but over the last half century in infant mortality. Uh, infant neonatal and postnatal mortality, have, all of them having, having dropped very considerably. Uh, <clears throat> this is infant mortality rates from respiratory distress syndrome. You can see a tremendous change. This is just since, the since 1980. And a lot of this, most of this represents, a, it's certainly not a, not, a, uh, not, not a lower rate of, of prematurity. In fact, children are now surviving who never would have survived when, uh, when, I, was, when I was starting in, in pediatrics. Uh, but a lot, most of this is improvements in, in supportive care uh, and careful research. These are survival trends in cystic fibrosis. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the birth cohorts, the, these, I'm sorry. From here on down is from 1960 and earlier. You can see that the uh, uh, by the time you got out to 20 years in 1960, on, only uh, about uh, by 18 years, only about 20% of patients were surviving. Uh, in the uh, by 1950, only about 5% of patients would would survive uh, as long as 25 years. Uh, now, uh, the, and the improvements have, this is birth years, so you have to follow them out for a period of time. The average survival for cystic fibrosis is 37 years. I like to remind Dr. Uh, Francis Collins, who discovered the gene and is very enthusiastic about the gene therapy of it, is that although we're looking forward to that, all of these advances have actually occurred uh, without any definitive curative therapies. All of these really relate to supportive uh, therapies. Same thing is true in sickle cell disease. We don't have really good data, but we can make some estimates about what survival rates were uh, for sickle cell disease uh, in, in past years. And if you go back uh, to the time of the original uh, description, uh, of sickle cell disease by Dr. Herrick in 1910. Uh, his original description was of a young man who was a dental student in his early 20s uh, with sickle cell disease. Uh, and as people started to look at this, it became clear that, that there, there really weren't very many adults with sickle cell disease uh, at, at that time. Over the next 50 years, there really weren't a lot of advances, although the sickle cell disease began to be understood. It was, it's the first molecular disease uh, by the late 1940s, the understanding that this was uh, a genetic disorder in which um, 
uh, in which there were abnormal uh, globin chains. Improved survival, however, didn't really come until some of the complications of the disease were noted by people who were taking care of these patients. The risk of death from sepsis, the availability of penicillin, uh, and then the availability uh, a little bit later uh, of pneumococcal vaccine and other vaccines really made a huge impact. So the National Sickle Cell Act was passed in 1972. Um, <clears throat> newborn screening uh, began to do, be done right after the uh, preventive <clears throat> penicillin study that was done supported by the institute in which I work. Uh, as soon as, as that study came out showing the effectiveness of preventative penicillin, uh, monies were allocated to do newborn screening. Once you have an effective therapy, it's worthwhile to do newborn screening and, and, and find patients so that you can actually implement uh, preventive measures. Uh, <clears throat> so tremendous uh, improvement in survival. When I started in hematology, about 13% of children in in this country who were born with sickle cell disease had died by what would have been their second birthdays. And now death in childhood is rare. Uh, it doesn't, it occurs sometimes, but it's rare. And it's mostly preventable. Um, and then studies <clears throat> done on hydroxyurea, uh, still underutilized, but, but out there. Uh, and transfusion for stroke prevention is improving not just the survival rate, but perhaps more importantly, the quality of survival for many of these patients. Again, this is without definitive therapy. There are a few patients who receive bone marrow transplants, uh, allogeneic bone marrow transplants, who are cured of sickle cell disease. There are some patients who have a very nice response to hydroxyurea uh, and great improvement in the, in, the, in the quality of their lives. But for the most part, this is without curative therapies. Uh, this actually changes the picture for this disease, which uh, <clears throat> when the Sickle Cell Act was passed uh, in 1972, much of the intervention was really focused on children because, because of the high death rate in children. Now what we have is a situation in which most of the people who have sickle cell disease in this country uh, are adults, and many of them live with a very high burden of disease. And so definitive and curative therapies with the availability, of, the potential availability of gene therapy uh, and broader application uh, with better understanding of bone marrow transplant uh, is, is really urgent to have, so we need to have some understanding to make some advances here uh, because there are a lot of people who can potentially benefit. Tremendous improvement in mortality for pediatric cancers. I don't need to emphasize this to this group. I think people here are well aware of the fact that for uh, children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, um, the uh, uh, mortality rates were extremely high, uh, really very recently within you know the memory of, of many of us, uh, and now a situation in which uh, almost 90% of patients overall uh, survive. Uh, considerable improvements in many other in the survival rates for many other tumors. A lot of opportunity, particularly in some of the sarcomas uh, and in central nervous systems. So we've come a long way. Uh, but I think if anybody uh, would, I, I, I haven't heard anybody proposing that we rest on our laurels saying, okay, we've made enough progress, we can all just go home now. Uh, <clears throat> that's not the way it happens. Uh, much of this research that I just talked about uh, has been supported by the NIH. There are others that, uh, that are supporting it as well. These are public funds supporting research, and I'll come back to that in a moment. However, we have a, a number of problems that come. I've mentioned a couple of them. Um, we have better survival rates for childhood cancer, but we have in a couple of areas evidence that pediatric cancer incidence rates uh, are actually increasing, particularly for uh, ALL, some lymphomas, uh, and brain and central nervous system. We don't understand this. Uh, <clears throat> we don't know why it's happening, but it's a very big concern. Obesity, a huge issue uh, for the future, for, for our children now and for, uh, for future health. Uh, and <clears throat> although there, there's a lot of attention to this and some hope that some of the programs that are now in place will actually uh, make a difference, <clears throat> we now have problems in terms of, uh, in terms of children who are extremely young uh, <clears throat> with significant rates of obesity uh, in, in very young children. Uh, and those kids who are obese early in life don't tend ever to get thin again. 
Uh, and so we really need to pay a lot of attention to that. Autism, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure all of you are well aware of what seems to be a very dramatic increase in the incidence of, of autism. Um, <clears throat> some of the increase in numbers uh, has to do with sort of recategorizing uh, kids as having developed pervasive developmental disorders um, who were previously categorized primarily as having mental retardation uh, or other diagnoses. Uh, <clears throat> some of it is uh, greater awareness. Some of it seems to relate to the fact that the risk of autism is higher if the, if the parents, particularly if the father, uh, is older, and that may account for some of the increase. Uh, but we also have a, has a situation in which the overwhelming majority of the components of the increase in, in rates of autism are completely un, not understood. We don't know why this is. Um, so there's a huge amount of emphasis that's being put on this right now. The reason I'm cutting across the spectrum for lots of different disorders is that all of these, these areas are supported by a lot of work uh, at the NIH, and I wanted to talk a little bit about where that money is both coming from and going. First of all, money, at, the funds at the National Institutes of Health are uh, allocated, appropriated by Congress. Uh, on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, that makes life very difficult because we have absolutely no idea each year what we're going to have. We used to have a better idea because usually there was at least a small increase every year. So if you had $30 billion last year, you could pretty well count on having $30 billion next year. You might not have more, but you wouldn't have less. That hasn't been true recently. Most of the funds that come to the National Institutes of Health do not stay there. Um, so uh, the, the budget in, uh, in fiscal year 2012 uh, was $30.9 billion. It's a little bit less last year. Uh, about 11% of that is spent on the NIH campus. Uh, but the overwhelming majority of it is spent outside the NIH in extramural grants, uh, contracts, and training. So it comes into Bethesda, which is a little star in there somewhere. There we go. And our job is to ship it out. Uh, and uh, what we've, the, the, one of the big challenges that we have right now is that with the, uh, the, the current funding situation and many of the discussions that are going on in Washington, uh, our actual purchasing power uh, has decreased. So if you look at the NIH budget in terms of appropriated dollars, okay, that's, that's the blue bar. Uh, you, you can see that it sort of went up relatively steadily. In 1998 was the beginning of the doubling of the NIH budget. That went through 2003, so you see this big bump here. And the appropriation in terms of buying power, that's constant dollars. <clears throat> okay, so it was going up rather steadily abruptly increased and doubled uh, over that period between two, 1998 and, and 2003. And then as the, the <clears throat> current dollars have sort of flattened, but inflation has continued, and particularly even though the overall rate of inflation may not increase very much, the increase in rate and inflation in research uh, <clears throat> uh, costs, which is called bird pie, uh, increases usually at about 5% a year. And the consequence of that is that the actual buying power of these dollars uh, has decreased. So if you see, if you go to 2012, the buying power in 2012 is pretty much the same as it was in 2001. Uh, and last year we had the sequester with a 5.8% cut so that it actually goes down. We actually have about a 30% cut in our buying power uh, over, <clears throat> over the last decade. And people in institutions such as this feel this very intensely uh, <clears throat> because uh, it really, because most of the funds come through NIH and come out here when we have situations like this, our ability to fund your work goes down. Uh, and you can see this in terms of the impact on the success rates. This is the uh, percent of grants that actually get, uh, that get funded uh, over those that, that are, are, uh, are submitted. For a period of time uh, in the mid-90s, uh, 
uh, late 90s, we were running a success rate in excess of 30%. That is to say, if you submitted uh, a grant to the NIH just on a purely statistical probability basis, you had a 30 to 32% probability that it would get funded. Uh, the end of the, of the doubling came in 2003. One of the consequences of the uh, doubling of the NIH budget is we trained a whole lot more people. So people submit a whole lot more grants. There are a lot more grant applications. The denominator gets bigger. Uh, <clears throat> the resources have flattened out. Uh, and you can see the impact here uh, <clears throat> in the decrement in the success rate. Um, I didn't add the last couple of years. It's now about 14.5% overall. Uh, <clears throat> so the probability that you'll get funded if you submit an NIH grant now as compared to, say, in 2000. Uh, <clears throat> Two is less than half of what it was then. And this is what all of you experience when you, you feel, realize how difficult it is to get funding. The NIH, however, invests very extensively in pediatric research. I spent, as, uh, as Ted mentioned, I spent two months at the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development and in, uh, as the acting director and started to ask some of the questions about, you know, where, where is support for pediatric research coming from? Because at Heart, Lung, and Blood, I've never had any interaction with pediatric academics as an, as an organized sort of group, whereas at Child Health, you have quite a lot. Uh, and uh, so I wondered where, you know, sort of that it seemed like a, a very intense focus. And this is in spite of the fact that we support at Heart, Lung, and Blood support quite a lot of um, a lot of pediatric research, all the surfactant work we supported, various other projects of that sort, um, pediatric heart network, various other. But there, so we support across the NIH individual research projects for individual investigator-initiated grants. Center and network uh, infrastructure, there is a center for autism research here. Uh, <clears throat> there are training and career developments, the T32 that uh, you have in developmental hematology is heart, lung, and blood. And then a wide variety of population groups, diseases, conditions, and research approaches uh, across the NIH uh, <clears throat> go for, uh, are, are invested. The Distribution of pediatric research funding across the NIH varies uh, from year to year. This is what it will look like in 2012. And you can see that NICHD uh, did indeed support uh, <clears throat> the um, largest single bolus of, uh, of pediatric research funding. But the National Institute of Mental Health, which supports a very large amount of autism research, uh, as well as research on, on other aspects of, of pediatric diseases, uh, was second. Uh, my institute, which has, uh, an, uh, has asthma research, uh, congenital heart disease research, a lot of sickle cell disease research, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Uh, we have a, a tremendous amount uh, <clears throat> of support across, across our institute uh, in, in pediatric research. National Cancer Institute, which supports the cooperative groups, but beyond that supports a lot of investigator-initiated research. Allergy and infectious disease, which among other things supports a tremendous amount of uh, immunology research, infectious disease, vaccine developments, uh, NIDDK, uh, kidney, diabetes, digestive disorders. Uh, <clears throat> the Office of the Director supports pediatric research through the, uh, through the Common Fund. The National Institute on Drug Abuse uh, supports a lot of pediatric work. One of the things I've been struck with in dealing with the National Institute on Drug Abuse is the focus particularly on uh, <clears throat> substance use and abuse in, uh, in young people. And I was talking to the director of NIDA, Dr. Nora Volka, uh, a few months ago. <clears throat> and a lot of that emphasis is because once people have established substance ab abuse problems, it's very difficult to treat them. If you're going to do anything effective, you need to get people early. Neurologic disease and stroke, um, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and uh, Use and Abuse, uh, and Environmental Health Sciences. All, all of these uh, are heavily invested in, in pediatric research. 
And if you look at the NIH inflation adjusted, so this is real money uh, funding that goes to children's hospitals and pediatric departments uh, over the last couple of decades, you see this, <clears throat> this is children's hospitals, this is independent and freestanding children's hospitals, and these are pediatric departments within, uh, within larger medical centers such as, such as this one. And it's continued, it's continued to rise. Uh, it's continued to increase. Pediatric departments have actually, from a relative standpoint, I think become somewhat more competitive. Uh, this is looking at the NIH grant success rates by medical school departments. And if you go back here to 2001, uh, <clears throat> pediatrics was, uh, was pretty much even with medicine, with some of the basic science departments doing better. And if you follow this now, and, and over the last several years, and this has been holding in, in more recent years as well, uh, <clears throat> the success rate isn't great but pediatrics is holding its own. It's doing as well as anybody else. Uh, the reason I mention this is sometimes I get the, you know, sort of, you know, we're, we're, nobody's, you know, nobody values us. We're not getting our fair share. Nobody's getting their fair share. So I think that it's a, it's a really important, uh, and it's important to understand that pediatrics is not only not disadvantaged in some areas, it, it seems to actually be doing quite well in very difficult circumstances. So this is a big problem, not just for all of <clears throat> you whose careers uh, are dedicated to uh, improving <clears throat> health and making progress for the next generation. It's also decreasing um, our global competitive, the competitiveness. This is looking at research and development funding by countries across the OECD. This is not specific to science. This is all R&D funding. And what you can see is uh, this is uh, over the last several years. Uh, this is 2003. Um, <clears throat> compared to five years earlier. Uh, and you see that there's a, about a 5% decrease in the United States with a 15% increase uh, in China in terms of investment in R&D. Uh, and U.S. scientific R&D, this is, this is more specific investment in science, um, is, uh, is, is really uh, is, in this, is in the same boat, is not getting the kind of investment that it needs for us to stay competitive. Um, even Germany and Japan are, are, are continuing to invest. South Korea is in, investing a lot, particularly in infrastructure. Uh, but Canada and the United States have actually decreased their investments. This is a real problem because the NIH and the United States has, have always been global leaders uh, in support of research. Uh, one of our great accomplishments is training people around the globe. Uh, I, I've been working in, in global health at the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and have traveled around the world. And one of the things that's very striking is that pretty much no matter where you go, you walk in and you find people who trained uh, in the United States uh, <clears throat> on NIH grants. Uh, and many people who, who've come, some have come to the NIH, but many have also come to other institutions and, and trained. Uh, <clears throat> and they now have opportunities at home that they didn't used to have. We're all seeing, and I think everybody knows about this, in fact, I'm seeing the uh, innovation uh, program that's being developed here, the Pediatric Innovation Program. I think you're having a conference on this in the, in the very near future that the uh, discovery and development pipelines for drugs and devices is, uh, as we know, in significant difficulty. Uh, <clears throat> there's basic research and discovery that has to be then validated. Uh, we had a meeting with a bunch of uh, leaders of pharmaceutical companies, and they said, please don't give us any more targets, no more targets. All we want are validated targets. We want to know that if you actually hit that target, you're going to get where you want to go. Uh, <clears throat> These are, this is a challenge. Um, these then turn into clinical trials and get commercialized. Uh, my institute has actually had the tremendous advantage of, of, being, of working in areas where industry's been very active. Uh, we supported the Framingham Heart Study, which uh, <clears throat> showed that lipi elevated lipids and hypertension uh, were risk factors for heart disease. <clears throat> we supported the basic science on control of blood pressure and, uh, and on, on lipid metabolism, but it was Merck that developed statins, not us. We had no, no role in, in that piece of it other than supporting all of the basic work and training the people who did that work uh, in the NIH intramural program. 
The performance sites used to go, it used to go pretty much directly from the research performing institutions, places like UCLA, uh, into R&D companies and then into manufacturing funded beginning by federal and state research and development and later by private funds. Uh, <clears throat> what's happened is that people have become much more risk averse. Uh, and it's because the uh, cost of these investments has gone up so much and the return on investment is a lot lower than it used to be. So one of the things that we're trying to do is to create some partnerships and collaborations uh, to help that along. Uh, we fund a, a, an activity called the Centers for Accelerated Innovation, and UCLA has one of them. In fact, all of the UC system is part, we have three grants out. It's all of Boston, all of Ohio, and the UC system. Uh, so this is going on here uh, in which the, um, the senior folks who are running this program are trying to find promising developments and help people. So we, we get people who have the expertise to, uh, to get across this gap, give people some of the skills that they need, and lower the risk. Uh, we also have been uh, putting a lot of investment, we, we have a lot of investment in small business innovation uh, research grants, uh, which we're actually mandated to do by Congress. We're trying very hard to ensure that, uh, that this is developing areas that we think are, are major opportunities. And we sort of decided, uh, there's one advantage to being the director of the institute is you get to make these decisions, okay, that pediatrics represented a vulnerable and underserved population. So we have a lot of SBIR initiatives out right now in pediatrics. This is one which we're jointly uh, supporting with the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development on safe and effective instruments and devices for use in the NICU. Uh, we have one on field devices for the diagnosis, non-invasive diagnosis of sickle cell disease that could be used in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. We have uh, a number of, of projects for things like uh, <clears throat> coils for MRI scanners to be able to get better imaging on small people. The, pediatric, the challenges and opportunities in pediatric research sort of go together. Small sample sizes make collaboration vital. Uh, this has actually tended to work pretty well in, pediatri in pediatrics because pediatricians tend to be pretty collaborative. Uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of rare diseases uh, which are inherently hard to study, um, congenital heart defects, mitochondrial diseases, a whole list of these. Uh, we all know the problems with hand-me-down medications really not being optimal. And research careers have become harder, harder to pursue. Uh, what we find is that having diversification of, of funding uh, <clears throat> is, is often helpful. The cardiologists have other ways of making money to support a significant amount of their research. On the other hand, that significant amount of money by, uh, <clears throat> by doing invasive procedures also makes it sometimes harder for them to make the decision to continue to pursue research. So we think there are a number of opportunities that are really exciting, and one of the ones that is I think particularly exciting uh, from, uh, from our standpoint are the developmental origins of health and disease. The extent to which if you have cardiovascular disease or hypertension uh, when you're an adult, it, its origins actually have to do with in utero exposures, with um, maternal deprivation, with the extent to which your grandmother may have not have been. Uh, <clears throat> adequately nourished. Uh, the advances in genomics uh, have been tremendous, be particularly because many, uh, most Mendelian diseases present in childhood, and even some of the complex diseases with genetic origin present early in life. The wide sharing of the data makes it much easier to access these, this information and actually turn it into usable, inf uh, usable knowledge. The microbiome. Uh, we think has tremendous opportunities uh, <clears throat> in terms of understanding disease. It clearly is important uh, in, many different, in many different ways. We're just beginning to get into this area uh, <clears throat> and understanding it in many ways, but particularly in pediatrics, we think is going to be very important. Non-invasive imaging uh, has, if anything, more potential benefit in pediatrics and other areas because it enables you to do things that you couldn't do without risk. 
uh, in, in, in many pediatric patients. And then gene and stem cell therapies, uh, <clears throat> we think the application of most of these therapies is, going, is likely to be most valuable, um, particularly gene therapies, uh, in, in childhood. And if you look at, again, you know, knowing, I mean, it went over some of the ways in which research findings have implicated, have impacted the public health uh, in pediatrics. The same thing has actually been true in adult medicine in some areas. This is looking at, this is from the New York Times about a couple months ago, improved survival from cardiovascular disease. This is the heart disease death rate uh, from 1958 uh, through 2010. This is age adjusted. People are still dying of heart attacks. But if they're dying of heart attacks at 80, uh, instead of 35, um, that's actually a big difference. And we've also had significant impact in stroke for many similar sorts of reasons. Um, <clears throat> So, but what it means is that we have a considerable improvement uh, in, in, in the health of people from the standpoint of heart disease and stroke, in spite of the fact that these things continue to be uh, major problems. The point of this article was that things haven't improved much in cancer, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but since they used us as a, uh, as a good example, I figured we'd, uh, we'd exploit that. Uh, the periods of vulnerability to environmental influences, this is the developmental origins of, uh, of health and disease, uh, provide opportunities for research in pediatrics, which are absolutely uh, crucial to uh, long-term improvement of, of public health and understanding some of the genetic epigenetic modifiers of early development uh, and then in postnatal life. These are real opportunities from the standpoint of research. The, uh, much of the, the work in genetics that has really had significant impact uh, in terms of, of diagnosis and in a few instances in terms of therapy uh, has really been in pediatrics. This is a, an article from the uh, New England Journal last year looking at uh, whole exome sequencing uh, in which there were kids who had diseases which appeared to be uh, genetic but in which nobody knew what they actually were. If you look at the age group of testing um, <clears throat> of all of these, there are 250 uh, people in this. Uh, <clears throat> four of them were in the fetus, 124 were under five, and another 94 uh, <clears throat> were in the five to 18 year age range. So out of this whole 200 and, and this, this cohort of 250 people, only 28 were not in, in, in childhood. Uh, so the impact, again, in pediatrics, the ability to make uh, diagnoses um, and to make diagnoses early, to implement therapies early. This is uh, adenosine diaminase 2 deficiency. Uh, really has its hugest, biggest impact in pediatrics. We've got a, a, a what we call a bench to bassinet program for congenital heart disease, and it's got three components. It's got a pediatric heart network, which actually does clinical trials. Um, it's got a genomics component, then it's got another basic science component. And this is looking at the genomics of congenital heart disease. One of the things that's very striking uh, in congenital heart disease, which has come from, uh, from this study, is that the vast majority of the genetic defects that cause, genetic, uh, cause congenital heart disease are, not in, are, are actually in genes which are uh, <clears throat> expressed during cardiac development and are control genes rather than genes which are actually coding for structural proteins. Uh, this is very important to know. You know, sort of gives you a much better idea of, uh, <clears throat> of, of, where, to, of where to go. But you can see that <clears throat> uh, looking in at, at some of these uh, uh, in con congenital heart disease compared to controls, if, they, if they're expressed in, in, to a, a very large extent uh, in the heart uh, during early development, um, you see a much greater odds ratio that you're going you're to find something in there. Um, this, is, <clears throat> this, is a, this tends to present in adulthood, but it's findable in childhood, and it probably needs to be intervened in in childhood, uh, <clears throat> which is, is uh, a familial uh, hypercholesterolemia. Uh, there's some new drugs that are coming out uh, which inhibit PCSK9. It's a very interesting story. Uh, in some of our cohorts, we have, we have the Framingham Heart Study, Jackson, Eric, we have a number of these studies. 
we found that there were a number of people who had hypertension, they were obese, they had other risk factors, but they had extremely low levels of LDL and uh, looked at a number of those people and found that they had mutations in a gene called PCSK9. Uh, this, <clears throat> probably because they have very low LDL their whole lives, so this starts in childhood, uh, have an, they seem to be really powerfully protected against, uh, against the development of, of atherosclerosis. Um, so we, we validated this as a target. That always makes industry happy. And they're very happy because these drugs are now getting ready for approval. They're in late stage clinical trials. And they bring your uh, cholesterol, your LDL cholesterol down rather spectacularly. This is a genetic abnormality which occurs, uh, or a genetic finding, I should say, it's, since it seems to be protective against disease, it's hard to call it an abnormality, which is seen primarily in people of, of African American uh, heritage. Uh, and this is looking at uh, the, this is the incidence of coronary heart disease in people who have these mutations. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this is the, no heart disease. This is have, actually having heart disease with a p-value of 0 .008. Uh, so it seems to be really pretty protective. Uh, and we think that it's very likely that the drugs uh, that target PCSK9, which, we, which clearly are effective in bringing down your LDL cholesterol, will probably protect against uh, cardiovascular disease. I mentioned the importance of the microbiome. Uh, we think particularly in the, uh, uh, the microbiome in the gut, uh, it has a huge impact on cardiovascular disease. There are metabolic components uh, <clears throat> which, um, which, which relate to, to cardiovascular disease. Uh, I think all of you are well aware of the extent to which things like C. diff and some of the GI disorders are now being treated with fecal transplants or fecal infusions. Um, it turns out that if you eat meat, you have a radically different microbiome than if you're a vegetarian, and that the uh, metabolic consequences of that may be very important in terms of the development of heart disease. Uh, some of the early data that we've seen would indicate that it's at least as important as cholesterol and maybe more so. Uh, and it has to do with the bacteria which metabolize, uh, which produce carnitine, uh, which is, is uh, <clears throat> it's related to metabolism of, of components of meat. Uh, and this relationship between what's living in and on your body uh, and the function of your organs <clears throat> is something that we're really at extremely early stages of, uh, of understanding. <clears throat> Uh, but it appears that the gut microbiome <clears throat> and the, the bacteria, the metabolic projects, uh, products <clears throat> have a big influence on inflammation. They have a big influence on atherosclerosis. And it appears that they significantly impact the development of obesity. There may be uh, microbiome patterns which are actually protective uh, against obesity. And as I say, we're still in a fairly early stage in terms of understanding a lot of this, but it looks like it's very important. Uh, we have a, uh, as I say, we've got a lot of work going on in congenital heart disease. Uh, the NIH campus is not a great place to take care of newborn babies. We don't have many of the facilities that we need to. So we placed a, an interventional MRI scanner uh, at DC Children's Hospital, which is across town. This is a public-private partnership. Uh, and we're joining our cardiac imaging expertise, which is extraordinary, uh, with the Children's Hospital clinical care. So they're actually able to do a, a great job of taking care of the patients. Um, and as I said, we're developing some tools and technology optimized for the pediatric patient, bringing in some private, or trying to develop uh, some, some private money, particularly stimulating that with SBIR investments. <clears throat> Uh, and trying to make sure that children are as well served as adults. Uh, this is some imaging, the studies that have come out of that partnership, looking at the development of white matter uh, in the brains of kids with congenital heart disease. This is, this is in utero. So what you can see is that kids who uh, have congenital heart disease actually have evidence of problems with brain development uh, starting ab about at, at 32 weeks. 
Uh, so this is you know well before they're born. Um, this is hypoplastic left heart. So this is this is serious congenital heart disease. Uh, but uh, we're you know clearly there are problems that are associated in terms of brain development that have uh, a lot to do. Uh, we're not sure what the what the initial origin of this of this is, but this again is going to require uh, a lot of further work. So we see many opportunities um, as uh, with, with in, in all of these areas. We're eager to support a lot of this work in partnership with you. We are, uh, are excited to see all the. Th I'm certainly excited to see all the things that are going on here, and uh, again, want to thank you for the invitation to speak. And I'm happy to address questions. Thank you.